My name is Mary Lloyd Ireland, and I am the creator and presenter of examination and imaging of the knee and leg. I hope you enjoy this presentation. With any musculoskeletal problem, a good history and physical exam is key to a correct diagnosis. I cannot overstate the importance of getting a good history from the patient. If there's a mechanism of injury that can be recounted by the parents or the uh, coach and a physical. When we think about histories, the grab sign, if you have particularly a adolescent athlete who grabs the front of their patellas, this is indicative of a patellofemoral disorder. If you have someone that comes in putting their fists together, you have to think an anterior cruciate ligament tear. These injuries happen in 70 milliseconds. They happen very quickly. You don't have to be taken out in a football game. They can occur just with a simple twist, turn, taking a ball out of bounds, other very simple step stops, uh, awkward landings. So if somebody puts their fist together, think about an anterior cruciate ligament tear. When examine knees, this is a patient who is very apprehensive because he doesn't want the examiner to push the patella out laterally. In general, the patient will not hurt themselves if you ask them to range their knee. Uh, in other words, when they have pain, they're going to stop. And I have never really injured a patient, whether it be a patellar dislocation or injured a meniscus further or torn a ligament by my physical exam. Do the most painful part of the exam last because you will create hamstring spasticity and it'll be difficult to examine the knee. So if I think someone has a patellar dislocation, I will do this maneuver last. And a positive apprehension test is when they get this look on the face. You're far enough down the leg so they can't hit you, but they feel like you're going to do what happened with their injury. In someone who you feel has torn their anterior cruciate ligament, oftentimes the leg is in external rotation a bit flexed at the knee and if you just put your your leg under their leg I usually externally rotate my hip and put my knee under their leg and do a Lachman test first you can make that diagnosis very consistently prior to getting them all upset with their hamstrings and doing that test last. This individual has normal alignment make sure you have the uh, patients in uh, shorts where you can examine their entire lower extremity, have them take their shoes off. So he is very muscle dominant. You can see the development of his quadriceps mechanism. He has had an arthrotomy of the left knee and a medial uh, repair and ACL reconstruction. He is less likely to have patellofemoral disorders. His alignment is uh, excellent. It's relatively straight. Q angle is low. This individual would be at risk for having anterior knee pain, perhaps patellar instability. If you look at her, she is more ligament dominant, doesn't have the quadriceps development that the male did. Her kneecaps are pointing toward each other, in indicating uh, femoral antiversion. She has an excessive Q angle. Her tibias are externally rotated, and her feet are in pronation. So therefore, the patella is the victim of this miserable malalignment. The, femora, the femur is rotated internally, so the train is medial, the track is lateral, and she would be at risk for having anterior knee pain, particularly if she is a runner doing repetitive loading sports. This individual happened to be a competitive diver and did have some issues in her sport. This is a rehab challenge where you would work on hip strengthening, work on her uh, foot um, with inserts, uh, and really strengthen her quad in a closed chain mechanism working on core function as well. Palpating the joint line is a little easier in flexion. McMurray described this test in 1920. He didn't really talk about the direction of rotation. In general, I go into hyperflexion and external rotation for the medial meniscus, hyperflexion and internal rotation of the tibia for the lateral meniscus, but flex them up to 90 degrees and palpate the joint. Typically, there'll be a mid 
third lateral meniscal cyst if there's a radial tear. And for a medial meniscus tear, it's typically that posterior half of the medial meniscus. So you'll have diffuse tenderness in that area. You can sometimes palpate a Baker cyst, indicating a intraarticular fusion. Uh, but this is more easily seen with them standing or lying prone. The Baumholm test indicates hamstring spasticity. It isn't specific for why there is a knee effusion. I find this very helpful in meniscal tears where you may have 10 degrees of hyperextension on the normal knee. I always start with the normal knee and then go to the injured knee or the less than normal knee. So the bounce home test, oftentimes you'll have five degrees less extension, and it usually will hurt them, particularly if they have a medial meniscus tear. But it's not specific to a meniscus tear. It's more that there is an intraarticular fusion and the joint is not happy. This is showing the bounce home test. Palpate the uh, facets of the patella. The patella should move equally. And this is the bounce home test that in this individual is negative. The patella should normally move uh, the symmetrical amount of quadrants, and the bounce home test going into extension is normal. The McMurray's test medially hyperflex the knee, as shown in the upper right. And this is where you usually really catch the meniscus, where you go into hyperflexion and external rotation, and they will hurt directly over the joint line. The description is pain and a pop. Oftentimes the pop isn't present, but reproducibly you can have them hurt in that area, and that indicates a medial meniscus tear. Typically it's that posterior horn uh, degenerative tear of the medial meniscus. If someone has a bucket handle tear of the medial meniscus, they will oftentimes hurt in the anterior attachment as well as the posterior attachment and have a more significant flexion contracture. This is the McMurray's test, hyperflexion grab their heel, go into hyperflexion, and that's where you will create pain and perhaps feel a pop. Hyperflexion, external rotation of the tibia, you can see I'm palpating the joint line, and that's when they'll feel a pop. And it typically is reproducible if someone does have a meniscus tear. For lateral meniscus, palpate the mid-lateral joint line. Oftentimes there's a localized cyst in that area. And to do the McMurray's, hyperflex and internally rotate. Again, palpate the entire lateral joint line, and you typically will feel a pop more in the mid-third, or you might palpate a cyst in the mid-third of the lateral joint line. Apley's compression test, have the patient prone on the table. The compression test is for a meniscus problem. The distraction test is more for a ligament, medial collateral ligament, or the lateral side. So if you have a larger individual, one you're having difficulty in examining using gravity, this test can help you have them lie prone. And as shown, you're pushing down on their foot and rotating. External tibial rotation for the medial, internal tibial rotation for the lateral. And then the slide on the right shows the distraction part of this where you will pull up on their foot. And if they have an MCL sprain, that should hurt them as opposed to a meniscus tear where you're compressing them. So you can better differentiate if it is a meniscus problem with compression rotation or a ligament problem with distraction. This is a video of the Apley's test. Again, you can palpate pretty easily and hyperflexion external rotation. They will hurt there. You might get a pop. Usually that mid posterior third of the medial side. And then to do the lateral side, just switch your hands up. And always think about which hand is the most efficient to use for you. So hyperflex and internal rotate. And then for the distraction test, we'll pull up and distract the thigh, so we're pushing the thigh toward the table and then lifting up on the calf and the foot. When we think about the lateral aspect of the knee, think about the IT band, which typically is going to be painful at the lateral epicondyle, sometime at Gertie's tubercle at the insertion on the lateral tibial plateau. So palpate that, very common in runners. Also think about the proximal tib-fib joint, 
the lateral meniscus, so palpate the lateral joint line to feel for any uh, cyst midlaterally. In flexion, test the mobility of the proximal tib-fib joint. Start with the normal side and go to the injured side. To test for instability, medial or lateral instability, you want to do this test in extension, 0 degrees, and then at 30 degrees of flexion. Typically I do it with their lying down on the table, make sure they're relaxed, have a pillow under their head. You can bring the leg over the side of the table, make sure their thigh is uh, supported, and then use the butt of your hand laterally to force them into valgus at 0 and 30 degrees and then switch that medially to force them into varus. Oftentimes there will be a 1 plus varus movement in flexion, but they should be stable in extension. If you feel that they are unstable in extension, you must think about a collateral ligament injury in addition to a PCL injury. So medial collateral ligament exam, I bring him over the side of the table, have him relax, test him at zero degrees, providing valgus force, and then 30 degrees, and we think about a grade one, less than five millimeters opening, grade two, five to ten millimeters opening, and grade three, greater than ten millimeters opening. This is based on AMA classifications from the 1960s. Note if there's a difference one side to the other side. When we bad instabilities, we can have straight instabilities or rotatory instabilities. The straight instabilities typically are a lateral blow and they have an injury to the medial collateral ligament, superficial and deep portions. Rotatory instabilities involve the anterior cruciate ligament and or the posterior cruciate ligament and the posterior lateral corner. The best time to examine a knee is when it is acutely injured on the sideline. Get the athlete away from the action and examine them. Document what your exam is right after the injury. This shows a bird's eye view of our instability patterns. And we think about an ACL being anterior lateral rotatory instability, meaning that the lateral tibial plateau rotates anteriorly. There also is a posterior lateral rotatory instability involving the posterior lateral complex, lateral collateral ligament. There can be an associated PCL injury with um, any knee in this location. So the classification of knee instabilities, rotatory, straight, and combined. So we talk about the plus by exam. Uh, four plus would be grossly unstable. And then the diagnosis is grade one to four. So think about that bird's eye view of the tibia and correlate the involved anatomic structures, physical findings, and the mechanism of injury. For the anterior instabilities, anterior medial rotatory instability in the upper left involves the posterior oblique ligament, the deep capsular ligaments. This can be one plus, two plus, when it involves more structures, the posterior medial capsule and the superficial medial collateral ligament, as shown. In the lower left, having combined instabilities of anterior medial rotatory instability and an ACL tear make this anterior lateral and anterior medial rotatory instability. Don't forget the collateral ligaments and examining them and determining whether these need to be fixed based on the exam and on the MRI findings. And then there can be four plus combined instabilities of anterior medial and anterior lateral and involving the posterior lateral corner. That would be grade four. Anterior lateral rotator instabilities with the ACL being out, the lateral tibial plateau comes forward. This happens in the mechanism of injury, the way they land, and also with our exam doing a pivot shift indicates that the tibia came forward the bone bruise pattern that we see on MRI scans at the time of injury is a posterior lateral tibial plateau bone bruise and a mid-third 
lateral femoral condyle bone bruise indicating a functional pivot shift. Think about the posterior lateral corner when you're examining uh, ACL injuries. It can be a little difficult to tell if there is a reverse pivot shift but go back and correlate your exam with a mechanism. Posterior lateral corner injury should not be missed. However, the mechanism, if this is contact, would be more a medial blow, and they would open significantly in varus testing, would have an external rotation recurvatum test, a positive dial sign when you examine them prone. Their lateral instabilities can be uh, graded as well, one through four. The involved anatomic structure from this bird's eye view would be the lateral collateral, posterior lateral corner. Certainly as the severity of the injury goes up and there's involvement with the posterior cruciate ligament and the posterior medial corner, we would have grade three instability. If we have ACL and PCL and lateral uh, capsule, posterior lateral corner, lateral collateral ligament, this basically is a dislocated knee, usually from a blow medially, and they would open in extension as well as in uh, uh, flexion to varus testing. Straight instabilities, you can have a straight lateral instability that's very rare. You can have um, a higher grade lateral instability where they open in extension, as shown in the upper right where the ACL, PCL, and lateral capsule, so you can have a straight and rotatory instability concept. Most commonly we see MCL injuries where they get hit laterally and they'll have a grade one medial collateral ligament injury as shown in the lower left. Or you can also have posterior medial instabilities that are rare, but we can't forget the posterior medial corner and the very important structures there that need to be addressed if there's a peripheral tear of the meniscus and posterior medial instability. Straight posterior instability, we grade these because they can heal and a grade two can become a one. And this is typically from a direct blow of the proximal tibia. This may be from a football injury. If the foot is plantar flex, they'll hit the proximal tibial tubercle. If the foot is dorsiflex, typically they'll hit the patella and may have a patellar contusion or patella fracture. Motor vehicle accidents we see with significant more force uh, where the tibia hits the dashboard. And so rule out other um, associated collateral ligament capsular injuries with that. So a straight posterior instability we see if there are no associated uh, collateral ligament injuries, this can be treated non-operatively and grade this again on the um, AMA criteria of 1 plus less than 5 millimeters, 2 plus 5 to 10, 3 plus greater than 10 millimeters, and typically with a gross posterior instability, you would also have associated um, collateral ligament injury. For anterior cruciate ligament injuries, the Lachman test is the most sensitive acutely when you have a hemarthrosis. Anterior drawer, I'll tell patients that I'm going to sit on their foot and basically you just pull the tibia forward like pulling a drawer out of a chest of drawers. You can palpate the hamstrings to see how tight the hamstrings are because oftentimes in an acute injury the first two three weeks you will have a negative anterior drawer despite an ACL injury because the hamstrings are at a mechanically better advantage and can do what the ACL does. So sit on their foot, do this test in neutral external rotation to test the posterior medial corner and internal rotation to test the posterior lateral corner. If you have increases in external rotation, you've got to think that there's a significant posterior medial corner injury. Increases in internal rotation, think about a posterior lateral rotatory instability. Here's our Lachman test. Um, you can bring them over the side of the table and again, just pull the tibia forward, do it forcefully. This is the way that I like to do it. I've got enough external rotation at my hip where I can put my leg under their leg. Stabilize the femur, it's not moving, and bring the tibia forward. Drawer coming out of a chest of drawers. Hamstrings are not at the best mechanical advantage, so usually you can get this test. Do their normal side and then do their injured side. When we do the anterior drawer, sit on their foot, pull them forward. You can also do this test by palpating the condyles and then levering them forward and sometimes this gives you a little better 
way to overcome their hamstrings. So think about our bird's eye view again, anterolateral rotatory instabilities. We may have a Sagun sign by imaging. This occurs very infrequently, I would say less than 1% uh, of the time, but it is an avulsion of the lateral capsule anteriorly, indicating that the ACL is torn. Push drawer, this can fool you because if the tibia is already back, you can pull them forward and think that you have an anterior cruciate ligament tear when you don't. So you want to palpate the tibia in relation to the femoral condyles. Normally the tibia is about 5 to 8 millimeters anterior to the condyles. In a PCL injury, it's going to be dropped back. Here's a normal PCL exam, again palpating the medial tibial plateaus in relation to the um, femoral condyles medially. So if there's a PCL injury, the tibia would be dropped back and there would be an asymmetric position of the tibia. And also you can have a straight posterior instability or combined instabilities with the ACL and the PCL and the posterior lateral corners. So think about those concepts of the rotation involved and what problems the patient's going to have, and you must address those problems acutely in a dislocation. So here are our tests for posterior lateral instability. We have our pivot shift, and then we have a reverse pivot shift. Physiologically, you can have a reverse pivot shift. This is the external rotation reeker bottom test, again thinking that the lateral tibial plateau is going to spin externally if they have a posterior lateral corner injury. So this is the external rotation recurvatum test. We flip them over on their abdomen and do the dial test to see if there is more external rotation of the tibia indicating the foot would be more externally rotated in relation to the thigh. Now we'll switch to radiographs and imaging. Typically, I have standard x-rays that I get on all patients. There are certainly many options. I think it's important to let your x-ray techs know what views that you want, particularly if you're doing research. Goniometers can be used to standardize the degree of flexion for views such as standing views and lateral views. You should know your x-ray technicians, and if cooperation is possible, all physicians should agree on their views so that we can do more studies to compare how our patients do. Standing views can be 45 degrees PA, patellar views, I do sunrise views, lateral view and flexion, and notch views to look for osteophytes or osteochondritis to seconds. There are grading systems for osteoarthritis. Kelgren and Lawrence is one. Fairbanks, basically looking for the joint space narrowing on standing views. There also is an all-back classification. Numerous studies compare these different classifications, and there is disagreement on the definition and grading of osteoarthritis. There's also poor correlation with patient symptoms and progression of osteoarthritis. It seems that in that sclerotic <coughs> knee, we see not as much pain as we do in an osteopenic knee, or the ones that go into valgus, go into valgus more quickly. The ones that enter varus may do a little better if they have sclerosis. The references of these studies are shown. I would suggest that you look at these references. Oftentimes, the plain radiographs underestimate the degree of osteoarthritis. I find getting standing 30 or 45 degree flexed views every year in patients who have done a meniscectomy will help them understand that the meniscectomy indeed was for soft tissue only and will not change the progression of your osteoarthritis but should be followed with standing x-rays every year. The 45 degree flexed weight bearing PA view is the most sensitive for detecting joint space loss. This has been demonstrated in studies recently by Durbin and earlier by Cole. These are what views look like. 
On the left is a 30 degree flexed and the right is a 45 degree flexed. You can see where there is a little difference in the amount of joint space that you can see. Do them in a standard way. Have your technician use a goniometer. And this is how the views are done. This is a view from the back. This is a sunrise view. I typically will do um, bilateral views so I can compare what the tilt of the patella is, the development of the trochlear groove and the patella. We use this jig to keep them flexed at 60 degrees. This is our lateral view. Again, you can use a goniometer to document your degree of flexion and please try to standardize that if you're going to do any patellar work where you need to get the height of the patella and the height of the patellar tendon. This is what the typical notch view is that gives us information about notch osteophytes. In adolescence we look for osteochondritis dissecans. When you read about the Rosenberg views, some are using those as their notch views, but typically this is the standard notch view. Uh, so if you're comparing studies, make sure that you know how that notch view was performed. Now we'll switch up and do some cases. This is a 14-year-old punter who was crushed by the oncoming line. You can see he has deformity of his distal left leg and the, his x-rays are on the side. This is a Salter II injury of the distal femur, potentially the most devastating growth plate injury because of a short limb or an angular deformity. The part that stayed with the epiphysis is called a Thurston Holland fragment. So if you see this, this should be splinted as it lies and get to a hospital that deal with children's growth plate injuries trying to put this into a splint can be a bit of a challenge so splint it with uh, medial lateral supports gentle axial traction but no attempt at reduction should be done you can the ecchymosis medially which is where the periosteum is uh, injured and so he has bleeding in that area and this is not an intraarticular problem this is a fracture you can tell that from the deformity if you have an intraarticular problem, there can be certainly a lot of swelling that will make the limb look ab abnormal, but it should not look abnormal into this amount of valgus alignment. This is an individual, 16-year-old, blow from the lateral side. You can see he doesn't have the deformity of the last one, but he does have swelling about his knee. It's kind of hard to tell. Is it intraarticular or extraarticular? He had a proximal tibial growth plate injury. You can see where there's widening of the medial tibial epiphysis. These x-rays were older and I did a stress view which we probably wouldn't do in this day and time. You can do comparison views to see if there is an asymmetry. An MRI scan would be my next choice in this individual. He fortunately had a grade 1 Salter Harris injury and did well. Here is his stress view. Again, you will not hurt the patient by doing this or damage the growth plate any further, but it is a very effective way to make sure parents understand that this is a growth plate injury, needs to be immobilized until it's healed, and the patient should definitely not return to sport prior to its healing radiographically. This is an interesting individual who was felt to have posterior cruciate ligament insufficiency by two other orthopedists prior to seeing me. He had fallen from a bicycle a couple of years before and had this deformity that actually he went into recurvatum, but this was a 20 degree malunion from a growth arrest of his proximal tibia. You might think, looking at him, that his tibia is posterior in position, but it is actually the, the growth arrest that occurred at the proximal tibial epiphysis, making his slant of his tibia, instead of 10 degrees posterior, it was 10 degrees anterior. So if you have a growth plate fracture, 
there can be significant angular deformity with a 20 degree difference of the proximal tibial slope. So here is his MRI scan two years before I saw him, particularly the scan in the middle. You can see the amount of growth disturbance there is and the incongruity at the joint. So basically the anterior part of his growth plate was not injured, the posterior was, and the posterior kept on growing, giving him a 10 degree slant anteriorly and what appeared to be a posterior cruciate ligament injury based on his exam. Here's his normal side up on the top and then here is his abnormal side with the slant now 10 degrees anterior tilt. So the posterior aspect kept growing and there was a growth arrest anteriorly. This is his uh, radiographs. Again the mechanism most likely was hyperextension. He crushed the anterior part of his growth plate. Posterior kept on growing resulting in this angular deformity. Here is his uh, exam, the normal right leg. See how the deformity is in the proximal tibia. It isn't that his proximal tibia is posterior. The way he compensates and walks as he walks up on his left foot, he can demonstrate that angular deformity going back this way. This is him post-op where we've done an anterior opening wedge osteotomy, correcting his angular deformity. We didn't do anything in the joint. His posterior cruciate ligament was normal. He did not return to sports, but had a significant improvement of his knee function. Here he is walking. See how he walks better. Still has some diffuse atrophy. Here's our procedure. We used iliac crest bone graft, put it in the proximal tibia, did an anterior opening, opening wedge osteotomy. There are now better ways of fixation. Fixed him with um, threaded uh, Steinman pins. He ended up uh, healing and did very well. Think about an angular deformity with a growth plate fracture in skeletally immature individuals with that type exam. Not a PCL injury. She's a 19-year-old collegiate basketball athlete. She landed awkwardly tearing her left ACL. Plain standing views look normal. When we look at the lateral view, she has an undulation of the lateral femoral condyle seen on the most uh, left x-ray. This leads us to think there could be an osteochondral fracture. It's rare that we see an articular cartilage injury laterally, probably in less than 5% of ACL injuries. We don't. We see the bone bruise on the MRI scan, but it does not injure the articular cartilage that we can see at the time of arthroscopy. She has a very narrow A-shaped notch seen on this notch view. So that's the lateral femoral condyle and that's what we get concerned about. That looks like an accentuated uh, indentation in the lateral femoral condyle. Maybe with a matching lesion of the lateral tibial plateau. This is what her MRI scan looked like. You can see the typical bone bruise pattern in the uh, lower scans. We don't definitely see an articular cartilage um, injury. These T2 images, it really does have that deep undulation. This is her arthroscopic finding, a mop anterior of her anterior cruciate ligament. Normal posterior horn of her medial meniscus in the lower right. In the upper right, is this impacted fracture of her lateral femoral condyle that was stable and goes along with her plane radiographs. We left this alone. She did have a peripheral lateral meniscus tear as shown in the lower left for which we did a lateral meniscus repair. This is a 42 year old who by his history didn't have any prior knee injuries and two months before I saw him injured his Tore his ACL playing soccer. He'd played soccer all of his life. We're getting better MR imaging of articular cartilage, but beware articular surface injuries in older players and soccer players because there's going to be some articular surface injury most likely. 
So his standing views look great. Symmetrical medial lateral clear spaces. This is his MRI scan showing his ACL tear in the typical upper third distal two-thirds. His hemarthrosis is seen. So cartilage look pretty good. Seen on this um, coronal T2 view up on the top. But the arthroscopic findings weren't so good. You see the bone edema in the upper right, but look at the significant articular surface injury here with the um, articular surface basically missing in the, knee. in the knee. There was no associated bony attachment uh, or anything that could be done to put the piece back. So we did a microfracture drilling that medial femoral condyle, removing the pieces, and doing an ACL reconstruction. Bone scans are rarely ordered anymore. If you have someone that you're thinking has an unusual problem, a tumor, regional pain syndrome, think about doing a bone scan. It's informative both for the physician and the patient. We don't get them routinely, certainly, but they can also be done in patients who have a progressive osteoarthritis. You can see what the joint looks like, um, and if it's a tricompartment arthritis, this may lead you to not scope the knee if it seems like it's a very angry, hot, inflamed blood supply everywhere by the bone scan. So think about a bone scan as something else in your armamentarium if it's not straightforward. Bone bruises uh, occur. Uh, we know of bone bruises since we started doing MRI scans in the 80s. We're not sure if it predicts development of osteoarthritis. Bone bruise is seen on the T2 image, a little radial tear of the lateral meniscus associated with an ACL tear in this patient. The bone bruise patterns are pretty typical. In an acute patellar dislocation, as shown here, the bone bruise will be more anterior in the lateral femoral condyle, and typically on the medial patellar facet. This individual has <coughs> a piece out of her patellar articular cartilage that is floating free in the joint. We don't usually see osteoarthritis occur from a single patellar dislocation, but we do if there's an articular cartilage injury or maltracking. In soccer, we see medial tibial bone bruise patterns pretty often. It can mimic a medial meniscus tear. So in those individuals that you suspect medial meniscus tear, an MRI scan is a good thing to get in your active high school or collegiate uh, level soccer athlete. Doesn't need to have surgery, but does need to be back down for six weeks. Takes about six weeks to get over a bone bruise and then do rehab. They do get a sympathetic effusion. MRI scans can be helpful to diagnose an acute posterior root medial meniscus avulsion. Sometimes you'll see a little associated medial tibial um, bone edema at the level of the root detachment that may indicate a chronic root detachment. So we need more follow-up in time for bone bruises to determine the significance of the bone bruise and development of osteoarthritis. Long-term bone bruises don't mean that the patient is doomed for osteoarthritis. In ACL injuries, we see the bone bruise occur laterally, acutely, but in chronic patients with ACL-deficient knees or even ACL-reconstructed knees, we see the compartment that's involved for osteoarthritis is the medial compartment. And we need further classification system for bone bruises and longer term follow up to see what they really mean. Late results after meniscectomy. In 1969, Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, classic article, Tapper and Hoover from the Mayo Clinic, did a retrospective review. This is very interesting because Dr. O'Donohue commented on this and really talks about the future of outcome studies. So Mayo Clinic, retrospective review, long-term follow-up, 1936 and 1956, of the patients examined 
113 were examined, 100 questionnaires. Males did better. The best results in bucket handle resection leaving a peripheral rim and do not leave a posterior horn if torn. This was certainly before we were able to successfully do repairs, so this was more of a meniscectomy article. In the discussion of this by Dr. Don O'Donohue, a sports medicine pioneer from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, he respectfully disagreed with their conclusions. Delay in operation does not affect the ultimate result. Patients under 20 years of age had fewer satisfactory results. Leaving the peripheral rim will give the best result bucket handle fractures. Conclusions are not valid based on the evidence pre presented. Evidence-based medicine, appreciated by Dr. O'Donohue in this discussion, JBJS 1969. Very impressive. The authors should be congratulated on their efforts to obtain a valid series, but it's difficult to get an uncontaminated series. In this day and time, maybe it's difficult to get a prospective randomized series, particularly in sports medicine. So his suggestion, 1969, probably a study should be initiated not after operation but before operation on patients whose surgery would qualify as a relatively uncomplicated meniscectomy. So we do need long-term follow-up on these patients and they deserve to be followed by us and with x-rays Hopefully there will be better treatments for osteoarthritis and prevention of progression of osteoarthritis. Another case, 55-year-old female. She had difficulty walking due to um, her left knee. She fell 10 years ago and was told she had a meniscus tear. Her height, 5 feet 5 and a half inches, weight 303, BMI of 43. Both knees were crunchy. Mild diffusion on the left, no calf tenderness, normal pulses. This is what her standing view looked like. It's her left knee that bothers her. Here are her standing views. You can see the significance of her osteoarthritis. Patella is socked in, lateral osteophytes, no joint space. Actually, there's more lateral tibial translation on the right than the left knee. Here's her right knee, significant osteoarthritis. So what test should we order next? She was seen by me in consultation after she received the next, next test, which was an MRI scan. Would one expect this to be abnormal? And the question with MRI scans is, it's a great adjunct in the diagnostic puzzle, uh, but would it have changed my treatment? No. So here's her MRI scan. She's going to have a medial meniscus. All 55-year-old arthritic patients do, unless they had it resected. The MRI scan shows what you would think, based on her plain radiographs, which is no articular cartilage medial, an extruded medial meniscus, whatever that means. But in this situation, the arthritis trumps everything else. As orthopedists, we convince patients that an arthroscopy will not help them because arthritis trumps everything else if you're playing poker or bridge. The MRI scan in the arthritic knee, in my opinion, is not of benefit. This patient surgically would need a total knee replacement. Her weight is 303, so she may need more than one. Address her underlying morbidities prior to operating on her. More tests needed would be counseling on diet, weight loss, exercise, and then a total knee. In my experience, after age 50 years in an arthritic knee, MRI scans are not helpful. We can assess the articular cartilage. Scans are getting better, but does it change our treatment? The meniscus is usually going to be abnormal, and I spend a lot of my days in clinic convincing people that their little tear of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus is not what is causing their symptoms. Typically that is in that varus alignment obese 50-year-old female. You want to look at the root of the medial meniscus. Baker's cyst is not the cause of the problem. It's an effect of an arthritic knee where the fluid leaks out the thinner posterior medial capsule between the semimembranosus and the medial gastroc. So if we think about trees and forest, 
forest is the arthritis. An individual tree may be the meniscus. But think about the big picture. And the plain films show us the reason for their stiffness and pain, and that's the arthritis. Imaging arthritic knee. Get standardized views. Get good standing views. Let the orthopedist order the MRI scan in the arthritic knee if you're the primary care physician. If we're really worried about articular cartilage that we think we may be able to do some specific treatment for, such as um, growing articular cartilage cells or other uh, advanced uh, procedures, then we will probably want special sequencing anyway, such as a death sequencing. And personally, I would like to order the MRI scan when it is rarely indicated uh, prior to an articular cartilage uh, problem and not have a bad scan from an outside facility. I was even scoping knees before MRI scans existed, and I still scope knees without an MRI scan if clinically they have mechanical signs and symptoms of a meniscus tear. In conclusion, make a connection between anatomy, function, history, and physical exam, particularly in relation to the functional disability, and make a specific diagnosis. We can think of the knee as being a biologic transmission or an envelope of function. In 1996, this was published in the Clinical Orthopedic Related Research by Scott Dye. And this is a good way to talk to your patients. Think of this as an envelope of knee function. The factors are anatomy, kinetics, physiology, and then treatment. If we think of the knee as a biologic transmission with an envelope of function, a knee injury is kind of like a car wreck. Some people have a huge envelope and can function without any problems, and others have a postage stamp size envelope and can't function hardly at all without surgical intervention, such as a total knee. The goal of treatment disorders is to broaden your envelope of function, resume activity safely, and as healthcare providers, we should inform the patient of this lower threshold of function and counsel them on functioning within the envelope that their knee allows them to do. In the management of osteoarthritis, um, there are several different approaches, intraarticular injections, topical analget analgesia, but I think a very important thing is the base of this, which is patient education, a wellness rehabilitation program, weight reduction, exercise, and we leave surgery of a total knee if the arthritis is as bad as I've shown on that 55-year-old uh, until after she's lost weight and become more healthy, she'll do better. Surgery for meniscectomy if there are mechanical signs and symptoms of an unstable meniscus, locking, catching, night pain in the face of very little osteoarthritis couple of uh, cases that I have seen that you may want to remember as you're looking at patients who might not present with a classic osteoarthritis history or meniscus tear history. You may not have seen it, but it has seen you. This is a 16-year-old basketball player who was kneed in his thigh. He came in and you can see this very aggressive lytic lesion of his distal femur which was an osteosarcoma. So young, healthy basketball athletes can have cancer, and we need to think about that. Look at your x-rays criti critically. You need to look at your own x-rays, look at your own MRI scans that you order, and not rely on the radiologists. This is another individual who had insidious onset of pain in the knee. This is a giant cell tumor of the lateral tibial plateau. In the face of night pain, no specific injury, think about some type of a tumor, benign or malignant. Plain films of oblique views. In this case, typically I don't get oblique views, but I would if I'm worried about a tumor. And this was treated with excision, curatage, and cementation. Giant cell tumor. You look for what you know, and you find what you look for. Think about that. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and learned something. Signing off.